Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask a Professor, a UWM anthropology web series where we ask professors questions about everything. My name is Pete Geraci. I am a professional archaeologist and academic assistant for UWM Department of Anthropology. I will be your host, and today we are asking Professor Robert Jeske about his career in archaeology. Bob has been a professional archaeologist for over 40 years. Bob's research interests include archaeological method and theory, particularly how economics and population interactions foster group identity and ethnicity. He also actively investigates stone tool production and use, mortuary studies, canine activities, and experimental archaeology. He primarily works in the American Midwest, but has worked on projects in the American Southwest and Ireland over the years. This spring, he will formally retire as Professor of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he has taught for more than 20 years. In this episode, we will ask Bob about how he got started in archaeology, what it took for him to achieve the status of professor and leader in his field, and how his students and time at Milwaukee have shaped him as an archaeologist and a person. Hi, Bob. Thank you for being here. Hey, Pete. How you doing? Bob, you've been active in archaeology since the late 1970s, excavated dozens of archaeological sites, mentored over 30 graduate students, published papers and books, and have put an indelible mark on Midwestern archaeology with your ideas and innovations. What inspired you to accomplish all of this? When and why did you decide to dedicate your life to this endeavor? Well, first off, thanks for the compliments. And again, thank you for having me here. Um, as far as what inspired me, it was, uh, you know, as a kid, like everybody else, I was, you know, excited by dinosaurs and by uh, early on reading stories of uh, various um, archaeologists and um, uh, in particular Roy Chapman Andrews, who uh, was a uh, uh, researcher who uh, worked out in the Gobi Desert with um, finding dinosaur eggs and so on back in, the, I believe, the 1930s and so on. And of course, National Geographic and all of the usual kind of things. Uh, I had uh, early as a kid um, received, a, I got a, a birthday present from an uncle, which was a kit on uh, Egyptian, uh, a little book on Egyptology, and then a little sandbox where you could dig through and find, you know, little little artifacts and so on. I think I was nine or 10 years old at the time. And so I always had that fascination. And, mm -hmm. um, but then when I got to, uh, got through high school, I just, what I was just really lucky with in my life was to have a series of people who guided me through um, academia and helped nourish my uh, interests. And uh, that's pretty much what led me to go into the field. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you grew up in Chicago, right? Yes. Uh, Franklin Park, actually, which is a suburb that's immediately uh, adjacent to O'Hare Field and to the uh, northwest side of the city. You know, my education as a whole has been very split. I did eight years in a Catholic grade school and then four years in a public high school. And uh, the neighborhood, neighborhood I grew up in was working poor. Um, and uh, it was a lot of factories around me, though, and those factories paid a lot of uh, taxes. So by just by sheer luck, the high school I went to was um, very well funded. Um, and uh, I had a lot of really great teachers in high school and, uh, I had a lot of really great teachers in junior high and from junior high through high school, um, they really also, you know, got my attention, uh, sometimes forcibly having to direct me, <laughs> in the, direct energies in the right way. Yeah, um, I can relate and, to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it did end up with me being able to go to Beloit College, which at the time was, even though it was a private school, was very, they had a very affordable system. They had a, a graduated tuition uh, uh, system. So it made it um, possible for me to get to, uh, to that private school. And Beloit was a great place. I mean, at the time, the uh, anthropology department was uh, really, um, archaeologically oriented. They had uh, uh, 
South American archaeologist, North American archaeologist, and a bioarchaeologist. And uh, so, uh, and they work together as a group, uh, along with the cultural uh, anthropologists, uh, to really give you a nice, well-rounded introduction to anthropology and to how archaeology fit in anthropology. And mm-hmm. a lot of, I also worked um, as a, uh, the Sunday um, docent, if you will, for the Logan Museum. And so I had um, 10 hours on Sunday where I just kind of hung out in the museum. Mm-hmm. And uh, that allowed me the ability to see what was going on behind the scenes, to look at collections and so on. So between the anthropology department and the museum, I was really, you know, quick, very quickly hooked on uh, mm-hmm. what, uh, what I thought I wanted to do. And it turned yeah. out what I wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you ever make it to the field when you were a kid? Uh, my my father was not big on going on vacations anywhere. So when he had his two weeks off from the factory that he worked in, um, what we would do is uh, one week he just kind of hang out and do what he did. And then the other week was one day we'd go to the field museum. One day we'd go to the science and industry museum. One day we'd go out to uh, the Brookfield Zoo. And uh, so, yeah, every year at least, if, if not, you know, besides field trips in from school, but every year we would do a family outing, you know, to the, to the field and to the science and industry museums. It makes me think of how important museums and places like that are for inspiring kids to, to follow this path of archaeology or history or whatever it might be. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, back then, you know, we didn't have anything else. I mean, when I was, you know, a small kid, there were just black and white TV sets with, um, four channels and then you know the slightly older kid you could you know some people had color sets and some people had um <laughs> you could get uhf channels just, you know along with the three so it was kind of you didn't have a lot of places to get information um so it really was uh things like national geographic you know that mm-hmm. came uh and uh you know going to the library and then these you know occasional abilities to go to uh something like the field museum that that really kept that going yeah after you graduate beloit um you do you go directly to grad school or did you take a year off or no i i took a couple years off and you know really at this point i i just want to go back to uh you know the earlier part of the question you asked me what what inspired me and i just want to want to say that you know i we stopped a little too early on that because (laughs) you know I, i talked a little about as you know my undergraduate and my my high school teachers and so on but really i my entire career has been simply being smart enough to be surrounded by really generous intelligent thoughtful people you know just like some people were smart enough to get born to really rich parents and have a nice life <laughs> at least i was smart enough to to be really uh, s- surrounded my entire life my entire career from from graduate from from grade school really from grade school on through graduate school not just my faculty um, uh, and mentors but my colleagues my fellow graduate students people I still maintain contact with to this day um, you know uh, colleagues uh, who um, I just you know uh, both in Indiana and here at UWM uh, I would be nowhere without them and then of course my students as well both undergraduate and, and but particularly my graduate students who've really done so much to kind of keep me thinking and inspired to to do you know whatever i've done has been because i've had all these these folks who've been who've been the um, really the this you know all the support and inspiration i could could use so it's been my whole my whole career has been mm-hmm. really i hate to blame them for it but it's been, <laughs> it's been them as far as yeah getting to school i mean yeah i went um I, you know, did the typical working my way through college thing. I had a job all, you know, I, I've been working full time uh, at one job or another since high school. Um, well, part time since I was in sixth grade, I've been working a, a job. I was a janitor in grade school. And by the time I was in high, <laughs> yeah, I, I worked after school. At my, at Jeez, my it really school. started you young back there. In sixth grade, I started in sixth grade as a getting a getting a paycheck from uh, from St. Gertrude's. And then uh, 
In high school, I, I worked uh, a number of jobs. So I worked at a liquor store, um, uh, parking lot attendant for a while. Then I got into the store and was a stock boy and uh, roadied for a band and uh, you know, I, uh, worked on a number of different factory jobs while I was in, in high school. And in college, didn't work that much during the school year. Um, I worked at the museum. Uh, and, but in the summers, I, I cooked. I started cooking at a restaurant and learned how to cook. And that got me through uh, college. And when I graduated from Bloyd, I, I got out in uh, – Bloyd had a very uh, weird system where you could go year-round and match – you know, you go like three trimesters, they call them. You go three in a row, then take two off and go somewhere. And I mean, they, you could mix up your schedule. So you didn't, you weren't a freshman, sophomore, or junior kind of thing. It was, are you a first termer, a fifth termer, you know, sixth termer? They used to do it by that, you know, they put you in those categories. Anyway, I, I managed to finish up uh, a half a year ahead of time by, by running a couple of trimesters together at the end. And my goal was to get out. Uh, work for a little while and go right back to graduate school. Uh, but I got out, I got a job working in a steel uh, uh, warehouse. And I was doing that for about a month and uh, just decided that uh, they weren't paying me nearly enough to haul as much steel around as I was expected to haul around. And ended up going back to the uh, restaurant that I uh, had um, cooked in uh, when I was in college and uh, got hired as a manager. And spent two years then managing restaurants uh so and so getting a handle on that side of the the business side of of the restaurant world and also the the company i work for uh basically gave me uh, about a, a year and a half worth of business school um, uh, classroom learning so learning a about you know inventory control and all that kind of good stuff in a formal setting was a very interesting kind of a, a thing to do as well. Yeah, so. I bet that really came in handy when you were starting off your career as an archaeologist in cultural resource management. Um, when you're having to wonder, you know, having to organize lots of of workers and um, managing supplies and time and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, by far not the first person to to note that the one thing that we don't give to our students enough of is practical training in management, um, in management of personnel, management of, and actually management of our own time and energy as much as anything else. Um, uh, guys, yeah. So, yeah, so re related to that, let's let's talk a little bit about your early career in Illinois. Um, I'm always taken aback by the the sheer amount of work you did in the mid '80s. Uh, you worked on large survey projects like the INM corridor, Chain of Lake State Park, uh, Fermi Lab. You published papers on Putney Landing and Washington Irving, and completed your dissertation all within the span of a few years. Um, how did you manage that workload? I was clinically insane. <laughs> um, the actually, um, I was um, building programs uh, because there weren't any that existed. And uh, back then, uh, cultural resource management wasn't being done that much in the Chicago area because of both the political uh, clout of developers and also the ignorance of archaeologists. I mean, you know, everyone was working, you know, you had the University of Illinois was doing the FIA 270 project and Campsville had the 408 project. So you had these gigantic, you know, CRM projects going on in rural southern and western uh, Illinois. And no one was really worried what was going around in the Chicago area. And when, um, Oh, when I was in the later stages of my graduate career and um, uh, being a single parent at that point, uh, taking, helping them take, take care of my daughter and um, uh, needing money, uh, I scrambled uh, to find ways to do this. And I got, again, I just was in incredibly lucky. I had uh, people who helped support me. I had uh, Tom Emerson was the head of the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency. He uh, uh, was the first person to give me a, a, a large grant to do the Chain of Lakes. Uh, people like Mark Lynott and Jim Brown uh, gave us the the project, the Illinois-Michigan Canal project that John Hart and I did together. 
Um, Rochelle Lurie uh, and I teamed up to form Midwest Archaeological Research Services in 1985. And uh, again, so I had, a, I had uh, the good luck to have people around me who believed in me enough to you know, give me these, uh, you know, give me these challenges. For that matter, Stuart Strever uh, uh, helped, uh, I helped him and uh, several other archaeologists, Alex Berkson, um, and uh, a number of other people set up a, kind of a, a northern branch of Campsville up in, in Elgin. Uh, it only existed for a couple of years before the, 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 the Center for American Archaeology kind of went ballistic uh, and kind of imploded on itself. Uh, but I took what we started out there and then moved that along. And then that's when that's when Jim Brown came along and that's when Tom Emerson came along and, and Rochelle Lurie came along. And we were, I was able to help kind of keep that together and turn that into a, a, a running project. And Mars to this day still is a uh, growing uh, running concern. Uh, tell us a little bit about Stuart Strieber um, uh, so that we can get a little bit background on him. Well, Stuart was a very famous, uh, well-known uh, archaeologist, uh, worked in the lower Illinois River Valley, uh, wrote a lot uh, and and coordinated a lot of the early archaeology in the late 50s and 60s <clears throat> and 70s on uh, Middle Woodland, uh, Hopewell in the Illinois Valley. Uh, he began the work at the Coster site which is a world famous archaic site uh, that they began working on in um, uh, from 69, I think, to 79, something along those lines, about 10 years worth of work at, this, at that area. And he basically was a, um, you know, if, if you've ever seen the, the movie Myths and Mound Builders, which every one of my students has seen, it had, you know, part of the story is, you know, Stuart got this research center in Campsville going that it was initially called the Foundation for Illinois Archaeology. And it became the Center for American Archaeology. I and he also that. helped to get going with the uh, the Colorado, the Southwestern Archaeology um, out in Crow Canyon. That was he was part of that. Of I that. did not know that either. Yeah. Um, well, it was there, but he managed to kind of the, the Center for American Archaeology added that on as a branch at the same time we did the Fox Valley or the Elgin thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, historically things went in different directions. But did you ever meet Stuart? Yes, yeah, Stuart. I was. Um, uh one of i wasn't one of stewart's students but i was one of the last people that stewart took on uh, as a on my master's uh committee he was uh, he and jim uh jim brown and bob vero were on my master's committee i'm really fascinated by him because he not only was an, an archaeologist but like you were saying he started all these programs and he was like this self-starter and like a, a huge cheerleader for archaeology and got a lot of people excited about it um, and, uh, so I, I'm always curious when I talk to people actually meet him, was he really like a charismatic guy or was he just kind of in the right place at the right time? No, he was incredibly charismatic. Uh, he had a, an incredible memory, uh, could, if he met you once, if he saw you years later, he would, if he didn't remember your exact name, he could remember enough details about it that you'd end up giving him your name and you'd never know that he didn't know your name kind of uh -huh. thing. And uh, he was um, uh, incredibly uh, uh, good at selling archaeology to the public. He was a great public speaker. Um, he was able to, and again, because he had this great glad-handed kind of, you know, politi po political, politician kind of a, uh, of a way of, about him. Western University archaeologist Stuart Strever. Campsville was a major river port back in the 19th century, all the way up till about 1920. When I came here 22 years ago, it was an uh, abandoned town almost, and we've taken over 39 buildings, made it into a permanent archaeological research and teaching center. So uh, tell me a little bit about your, advi your graduate advisor, Jim Brown. You mentioned him a few times already. Uh, how did he in influence your career? Did you go to Northwestern to study with him, or was it just kind of, you know, how did that happen? Well, actually, I um, went to Northwestern because I wanted to study with Jane Bikestra. Um, I, my undergraduate training was really more of a bioarchaeologist. I, my uh -huh. mentor, um, was a, a gentleman named, uh, Ed Way, uh, J. Edson Way III, actually. Um, and even though I, I did a field school with Bob Salzer and, and Bob Birmingham was the assistant director on that field school, 
my my real role model was was Ed Way, who had done uh, uh, bi bioarchaeology of um, uh, Inuit uh, populations, or um, actually um, Dorset Thule populations, but Arctic uh, folks, and. Um, that's what I kind of wanted to do. And but when I got to Northwestern, again, just for various reasons, Jane um, directed me to a, a guy named um, Bob Vieira, who was a, a, a Binford student, recent Binford student from New Mexico. And Bob was my initial uh, advisor. And um, I didn't really have that much to do with Jim uh, Brown for my first year or so in graduate school. And it was only after Vieira left Northwestern that I um, took Jim uh, and asked him to be my, you know, to be my advisor. And he reluctantly took me on. And you know, <laughs> so, you know, years later, he's still stuck with me. But it's been great. <laughs> he he really did a, a magnificent job of of kind of keeping me on a straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've I've had the the great fortune of of meeting um, Jim, and and he. You know, we were talking about Stuart of, of you know remembering people of great memory. Jim, Jim is one of those people too, and I've I've met him at conferences and and you know a few years pass by and he'll you know he'll recognize he'll remember me and you know and I always, I look up to you know Jim Brown because he's written so much and he's been done so much in his really really long career. Um, so it's it's always neat when somebody like that recognizes you. Yeah, he's a great guy. Just a, he's a he's a really good human being. So after you graduate Northwestern in '87, you were working as a part-time lecturer and running a cultural resource management company called Mars with colleague Rochelle Lurie. Uh, you finally get offered a position at Indiana Purdue University Fort Wayne. Um, walk me through that moment. Um, well, it's like any other, uh, you know, moment. I mean, uh, actually, I <laughs> was in the shower when the phone call came. My, my <laughs> housemate came and yelled through the door. That I needed to get out of the shower because uh, someone from Indiana was calling, and which you know, I'd already gone and done my interview and stuff. So, um, so I was actually accepting the job. I was wrapped in a towel, you know, <laughs> dripping water on the kitchen floor you know, back, hoping back you're not getting electrocuted by the phone yeah. <laughs> yeah back back when phones didn't move you know um, <laughs> yeah but but basically what happened was i i uh i had been working uh doing the crm uh related things they, i started working in in uh crm in 1979 actually the mm -hmm. uh, end of 79 i started i did my first field tech work and i did field tech work in uh um uh, Northern Illinois beginning in 1981. I started doing some work up there in 81. And uh, supervising uh, in 82, I ran, uh, started teaching uh, field schools out of Elgin Community College in, um, and through the Center for American Archaeology, 83 and 84, uh, doing that, but doing also doing CRM projects with them. Kind of a, it's a combination. Again, it was trying to get the center going. We were doing lots of different things. And by uh, uh, my colleague Rochelle, who had gone also, she had finished her dissertation at Northwestern in '82. She was down in Northern Florida, or actually University of Western Florida, uh, and she had come back in '85 as I had been working on a number of of contract um, jobs. And uh, again, back then there weren't a lot of of people doing contract in any kind of a systematic fashion. And she came up and we talked over what was happening and uh, we struck up a partnership and formed Mars. And uh, I believe that was in like February of 1985. And again, we just started doing really systematically what I had been doing and what other people had been doing kind of in an unsystematic fashion. And by 88 had a pretty decent company hiring people actually paying them real money kind of a mm -hmm. thing instead of the catch as catch mm -hmm. can as most people had been doing up to that point uh building a decent reputation and uh the problem with that for me was i felt it was really important that um i tell people what i thought was happening 
<laughs> uh, yeah, my father always used to say it was a free country. Everyone was entitled to his opinion. And I kind of felt that I wanted to, you know, let people <laughs> have, have the freedom to, uh, to, to read what um, my thoughts were. And um, so the problem was with doing uh, CRM work for me was we would finish a really interesting project and then we'd move on to the next one. And, and we never had really the time to sit back and think about what we were doing in a, in a you know, theoretical way. I mean, I was brought up with, with all this, you know, highfalutin, you know, archaeological theory stuff, you know, in the from, you know, Jim Brown and, and Chris Peebles and, and right. Jane Bikestra and, and yeah, I all, all these great ideas about what should be happening. And um, I wasn't able to really impart that onto the data that I was collecting. And so I decided to go back to uh, into academia. And then, so I applied for jobs and, and, and was given this one at, in Fort Wayne. And I figured, oh, I'd, I, you know, I never even heard of Fort Wayne, frankly, uh, when I applied for the job and uh when i got there i figured okay fine i'll be here for a year and then i'll go some somewhere else and uh, i ended up being there for nine years um right and um <laughs> had a great time it was a wonderful learning experience for me i mean uh settled in uh to um you know a project you know working on you know just a a set of projects you know uh, mm -hmm. that i was able to teach undergraduates in a that I was able to work through more than a couple of years that I could do at the you know community college level. What were uh, you working on uh, while at Fort Wayne? Well, um, we had, uh, I was doing CRM work as well. I maintained a CRM program there, uh, fairly small scale, but it was enough to bring in money to help me fund students research. And we had on campus, we had a couple of sites that I could work with. Um, and then there was also in town, there was a large uh, house that was built by um, Jean-Baptiste uh, de Richard V, or otherwise known as John uh, Richardville. And uh, he was a Miami civil chief, uh, 1815 to 1841, uh, and was uh, one of the most important figures in Indiana history. And he had this gigantic house that, uh, for the time, in 18, built in 1824 two-story brick building with uh, uh, kind of a Greek revival uh, animus. It was kind of a Federalist slash Greek revival house. Really, really cool. Much bigger than any of the houses that the local Euro-American um, settlers would have been living in at the time. And so I was able to work on this. Uh, the Historical Society purchased the property and asked me to head a committee that was to help them work out how to deal with this gigantic artifact they had just acquired. <laughs> so, um, so I was able to work on it with them for about seven years on that particular project. And we excavated there a couple of years. And um, uh, I've got uh, one PhD uh, ended up coming out of it many years later. Um, and uh, was that your first PhD student? No, no, um, no. Uh, that was just um, a couple of years ago. Uh, my very oh. first. My, my very first PhD student was uh, uh, Sung Woo Park from Korea, who worked with uh, materials from the Zimmerman site that I had excavated in the 80s and 90s. Picking up off of that, in 1997, um, you're offered a, an assistant prof or associate professorship at UWM. Uh, were you excited to come to Milwaukee? Uh, did you already have a relationship with some of the people at UWM, or was it a completely new experience for you? Well, I I had known about Milwaukee since I mean I'd, I'd gone to Beloit College and um, you know so there's a triangle you know Chicago Beloit and and Milwaukee and uh, the Milwaukee of the 1970s and the 1980s was not a very cool place essentially it was it, you know my my idea of Milwaukee was it was in decline and that was from the you know my initial contacts with it um, but. Um, my wife and I were uh, quite happy to uh, uh, leave uh, Fort Wayne to Milwaukee. Um, when I interviewed here, the students were really interesting. The faculty that I talked to were really interesting. Um, I had uh, the idea of working with graduate students. I didn't, was having a great time with the undergraduates at, at uh, Fort Wayne, but there's a limit to what you can do with undergraduates as far as you know, letting them you know, take off and work independently. 
and it was uh, it was a great draw for me to to have this notion of, of coming to Milwaukee. I did know some people here. I didn't know any of the faculty really, but I did know a number of the under uh, a number of the graduate students here because they had been undergraduates of mine at um, Fort Wayne, and so oh, okay. we had a had I, I think three uh, at that time uh, three people who had worked with me at uh, in archaeology at, at uh, Fort Wayne had come to uh, UWM and were working on their uh, master's or had gotten their master's um, and were to begin to work on their PhD here. When we got, when my wife and I came to Milwaukee in 1997, we were thoroughly amazed with the city. The, the change from 1978 Milwaukee to 1990 seven Milwaukee was astounding. Um, it was, uh, we were bowled over and Milwaukee, as far as I'm concerned, is the nicest place I've ever lived um, in terms of what I want out of a place to live and what my wife wanted out of a place, my wife Steely wanted out of a place to live. It was been, and we were amazing, uh, amazingly thrilled when we got here and have been happy ever since. So I just want to make that really clear. Uh, <laughs> having having kind of trashed it at the beginning of our conversation, <laughs> I want to make sure that um, no, I, I I love Milwaukee and it's been great. Um, but uh, so just to make that clear, um, <laughs> when you first got here to UWM, uh, you were named the director of the archaeological research laboratory, right? Sure, sure, yeah. Well, I. <laughs> To be clear, the director of the Archaeological Research Lab is really a m much more of a, a uh, honorific title than it is anything else. Um, I don't actually run the lab. The, you know, none of the faculty report to me. Um, none of the people who work in the lab actually report to me. Um, the laboratory is a um, uh, well. What the laboratory was before I got here, I don't know really. I, you know the. Mike Fowler and, and Lynn Goldstein and uh, Elizabeth Benchley and other archaeologists who are here, they had their own kind of a lab. But I came here in 97 and, with Jim Brown and with uh, Jim Brown. Oh, gosh, <laughs> this is what happens. This is why I'm retiring because I, <laughs> I can't remember things at all. But uh, John Richards and, and Pat Richards and Bettina Arnold, uh, we all got – Bettina got here, I think, a year before. Uh, and um, – and John and I had to sit down and talk over what director of the lab versus director of the cultural resource management program meant. And essentially, John, for the for 23 years until he retired last year, ran the lab itself. And of everything of any importance, you know, John was, you know, people reported to him. John uh, ran these very large projects with money and that had money and so on. Uh, and John was really the, you know, uh, the really the heart and soul of what we have today. My contribution really to the lab was obviously, you know, I like I said, I'm very happy to give my opinion on things. And and John and I could work things out and talk things over as to what had to be done, uh, what made sense for working the lab to make it work for, you know, when we hired Gene Hudson, when we hired uh, Jason, Jason, uh, and when we hired Laura and um, you know, how everybody fit in together. Uh, and my job, I think, really was to be a liaison between the the archaeology, the applied archaeology, and the academic archaeology. And so I was, that, and that really is what I was hired for, was to be able to kind of bridge the gap between cultural resource management and academic archaeology. And I think, um, you know, but between the academic archaeologists, my colleagues on one hand, and the the CRM archaeologists that we've had working for us all, over all these years, we've all been able to work very closely to make sure that graduate students and undergraduate students alike felt part of both academic and theoretical archaeology and an ability to do an applied archaeology. And I think running the field school for all these years with that in mind was was a big part of that as well that that's i think was my contribution was helping to train students who could see both the theoretical and the practical aspects of it and and work with with um you know faculty and academic staff with equal facility a few years after you arrive at uwm you begin excavating a site along lake koshkanong in southeastern wisconsin called the crescent bay hunt club site what drew you to the site and what are some of the things that you've learned from working there over the past two decades? 
Well, what drew me to the site was desperation. Um, actually, I had uh, my first summer here, I had a field school to run and uh, I needed to find a place to work very quickly. And uh, I did find a place. It was a, um, on property of uh, some folks up uh, in uh, uh, River Hills, actually, along the Milwaukee River. And uh, I started to work, unfortunately, um, either through miscommunication or a number of other factors. They weren't quite aware of the number of people who would be working on their property. And it was clear after a couple of weeks of working at this late archaic site, which wasn't going anywhere. It was a, it was all in the plow, not a plow zone, a, uh, the A horizon uh, of this site. A couple of features, but it wasn't that much. But they were uncomfortable with having so many people on their property. But, you know, they had a, wooded, a wood lot, but nonetheless, it was clear to me that they were not thrilled. And uh, fortunately, one of our graduate students here uh, knew that Guy Gibbon, um, who had uh, gotten his PhD in back in the 60s uh, from Wisconsin, but had been here for a short time, had left the notes from an excavation at this Crescent Bay Hunt Club that had been done by Professor Barris out at uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, so we had the some notes and some maps and, and, a, and a manuscript and that had been done in the late 60s, so 1968. And she pulls this file out and says, maybe they'll let you go out there. So we got in contact with the landowners. And so we cleaned up our stuff at the one site we were working on and I booked everybody out to uh, Crescent <laughs> Within Bay. the same season? Same season, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. And we spent four weeks out there in that summer, uh, found that uh, that uh, we, we found the original 68 excavations and uh, managed to lay out a grid and figure out where the site was and figure out where the site boundaries were and everything got and got some initial excavation done. And the, the gentlemen who uh, were all 13, uh, 13 men own this property and uh, have since 1940, uh, one, I believe it was. And they bought this farm and split it up and they all have shares in this club, gun club. And they were quite happy to have us out there and said, anytime you want to come back, you come back. And so for 10 field seasons over 20 years, we went back and worked on their property and they were have been again it's another one of those things where in my life i just happened to have the right people come by and say here you know and mm -hmm. and you know made things happen and it was uh it was a just a stroke of great fortune so tell us a little bit about the site um uh, when was it occupied what was taking place there what kind of archaeology have you found there well, Crescent Bay itself is uh, on top of a elevated um, limestone uh, outcrop, and it's high above the lake, it's about 300 meters away from the lake, and uh, high elevation. It's got great light uh, sight lines, and it's in a nice defensive. There's a there's a cliff basically right in front of it, and it slopes down on a couple different sides. But it's a site that dates to. Um, the majority of the occupation is AD 1200 to 1400. There may be a, a slightly earlier occupation there as well, but it's a it's amazing because it's a single component site in that it's a we call it Oneota. The archaeological culture is called Oneota, and it's not mixed up with earlier materials or later materials. It's in it's in a, a nice uh, secure context. Centuries before Columbus landed in America. A people lived by the shores of Lake Michigan, along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, and near the streams of the Great Plains. Only traces of these ancient Oneota cultures remain today. It's one of a series of sites that runs along this, this limestone outcrop along the northwest shore of Lake Kashong. And there's a, another famous site uh, to the south of us uh, called Karkaju Point. And then to the north, there's a series of other sites, uh, the Schmeling site. And then just five kilometers away is a very famous site called uh, Karkaju Point. 
and I'm sorry, did I say Carcadu Point? I meant Crab Apple Point to the south of us. Okay. Carcadu Point is about five kilometers away. I'm sorry. I've got myself turned around. <laughs> it's okay. As usual. There are a as lot of usual. sites along Lake Koshkanong, so I think you're, yeah, they're, you're they're, okay. They're like, they're like beads on a string, basically. They go around They go around the edge of the... Actually, that picture right back there, that's Lake Koshkanong up on the wall. Um, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but there's a series of sites, and over the course of 20 years, I've worked at Crescent Bay, but we've also expanded um, and worked at a number of other sites, including Kashanon Creek Village, and including Karkachu Point, including Crabapple Point, including a site called the Schmeling site. And I've had graduate students, I think we've done about a dozen masters, maybe 15 masters have been done on those sites and uh, master's theses, and then five, I think, dissertations from so far, and with um, maybe at least one more to come from them. Ranging a lot of topics, too, from stone tools to uh, human skeletal uh, features, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so for example, um, We've had uh, Kat Sterner just recently did one on all the stone tools, uh, her dissertation. Another dissertation was uh, Kate Foley Winkler's uh, looking at mortuary practices using these and, and other sites. Um, I've had master's students doing um, copper analysis, doing uh, the examining kinopodium. Uh, Rick uh, Edwards did his dissertation using uh, uh, dietary um, isotopic data from dogs from the sites uh, to talk about uh, uh, maize and, and meat. Uh, Seth Schneider's did a tremendously large number of, of uh, ceramics from the site. Uh, other people have done master's thesis on ceramics. Um, they've had people do a master's on uh, GIS-based uh, uh, information um, you know, spatial information, a couple different dissertations along that line. So, uh, yeah, just a huge variety of, of topics have been covered. Not nearly enough. I mean, we're, we've barely scratched the surface of the analysis of the site over the years, but um, it, it's a, uh, it's, it's been nice. And we finally were able to, to kind of publish kind of a little bit of a synthesis uh, this uh, in, in 2020 in the Midwest Archaeological Conference's occasional uh, publication series. Um, uh, about five students and I managed to to kind of write up something on the ceramics and the, the mm -hmm. diets. Uh, Rachel McTavish uh, uh, worked with her dissertation materials on the faunal uh, uh, um, archaeology, zoal archaeology material. So a lot of, a lot of different <laughs> things. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's amazing and and shows, you know, your range as a perf, uh, as an archaeologist that you're able to advise all these students and this many different uh, topics of archaeology. Um, it, it's one of the tricks that Jim Brown taught me, uh, which is, you, you know, the person who's doing their dissertation is going to be the expert in the field. And all you need to know is enough to be able to ask them questions. And so... You know, yes, I know a little bit about stone tools. I know a little bit about ceramics. I know a little bit about, um, you know, uh, mortuary practices. I know a little bit about copper. I know enough to to help direct students to let them become the experts in the in the field. And that's it's worked out really well. <laughs> I bet you've learned a lot, too, over the years. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, the 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 whole reason for being a teacher or a professor in my mind is that you learn from what your students are doing. Um, that's, that's the point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, you spend a lot of time trying to help them find uh, ways to learn and, and, you know, you lecture and you ask questions and you cajole and you, you find things for them to read and you hopefully find databases for them to work with. But in the end, all of that comes back to you. And all that work comes back to you many, many times over by what they produce. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a tremendous um, privilege to watch that happen. So let's talk about dogs. Everyone loves dogs. Um, <laughs> yeah, everybody loves dogs. <laughs> you published your first paper about dogs in 95 with Larry Kuzner and go on to uh, collaborate with Larry on and others on several papers in the 2000s. Um, and most recently, like you were saying, um, with one of your graduate students, uh, 
I know you're a dog owner. You've rescued a number of greyhounds over the years. Uh, were you always interested in archaeology of dogs, or did your own dogs inspire you? Well, it's it's interesting because, uh, ironically, my first advisor, a uh, guy named Bob Vieira at Northwestern, um, my, I came to him to, with a idea, I, and I have no idea where I got this idea. It, it had nothing to do with any of my dogs. I was allergic, and still am allergic to dogs, um, and so I didn't have a dog. <laughs> but uh, I asked him, uh, said I want to do my master's on uh, dogs and dog domestication and dogs' effect on the archaeological record. He didn't come right out and call me a moron uh, or an idiot, but from his tone of voice and the way he described my idea as trivial, I could tell that he felt um, there was nothing useful to do about dogs. So this was in 1980, uh, and I first had the idea to start working with dogs. And so um, he shot that down, and I ended up doing stone tool analysis from a site in Peru. Um, but... Uh, the the work with the dogs was very serendipitous it was i had um, a number of dogs and they were just digging holes all over my backyard and just huge numbers of holes everywhere and one morning i was out uh, very way too early in the morning for me uh with a cup of coffee in my hand you know and i had a doberman pincher named Roz, who had dug this hole into the side of the little small little bank and I was looking at the hole and I was looking at the materials that had popped out of the hole. And then as I was looking down, I thought, oh, my God, this looks just like a feature I had excavated in 1980 down in the lower Illinois River Valley um, at a site called Napoleon Hollow, where we were two meters down in 5,500 year old deposits, uh, our, our middle archaic deposits. And we had found this pit feature that someone had dug into and then had then filled it in and then there was someone else to come by and dug into it and left this spray on the surface and you could actually see this archaeological it was an amazing uh piece of preservation in the archaeological record and then i'm in my backyard in fort wayne indiana i was on a sabbatical to do to look at stone tools and i looked down at this hole in the ground and i went huh this is weird so I called a colleague of mine, an uh, ethnoarchaeology uh, colleague of mine, and said, hey, anyone done any work on the ethnography of, of dogs and digging holes? And, you know, having awakened him at seven o'clock in the morning, he wasn't thrilled about it. But what he <laughs> told me was, you know, he'd get a look at it. And he came back and said no. So we started this project with looking at dogs and the behavior. And, and so I spent uh, six months sitting on my back porch watching my dogs recording what they did and what kind of holes they dug and and what they were doing with them and he was doing the same with his dogs and that would enable us to larry cousiner uh and i did to write our first um uh, paper on dogs and their effect of the on the archaeological record we since went on to wolves uh, as well and uh um my my wife worked at the Milwaukee County Zoo, and I had access to the wolf pack at the zoo. And so with uh, another uh, graduate student, uh, 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 Roberta Boschkowitz, um, we um, were able to, again, observe the wolves for quite some time to see what they're doing, went in, and then did archaeological excavation of their features, and uh, along with a couple of other side projects as well with the wolves. So dogs and wolves have been something I've, and still I am working on right now to this day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then just serendipitously, um, Rick Edwards uh, discovered how we could look at um, dog bone uh, as a proxy for human bone, um, because we can't do destructive testing of human remains in Wisconsin. Um, but it turns out that dogs are a pretty good proxy for looking at uh, stable isotopes in uh, to to get at people's diets. Mm -hmm. And so he used for his dissertation, he used dog bone in place of human bone to talk about uh, dietary differences around the country. So yeah, dogs and all, what dogs eat, how dogs dig, how dogs reflect human diets. It's all been part of it for the you know for quite some time now. Now has the literature on that grown? since the 90s oh yeah yeah no i missed out entirely my uh, um <laughs> thanks thanks to my first advisor um there's just been a tremendous obviously it's huge you know, part of it's the genetics a lot of people are very interested in domestication and genetics 
But yeah, a lot of ethnoarchaeology has been done on dogs, uh, but it tends to be what dogs do to bone. So when people throw out bone, how much chewing the dogs? So kind of looking at taphonomy. Mm-hmm. What Custer and I did differently from most people was instead of looking at what dogs chewed on, we looked at actual how they affected pits and, and more importantly, pits that we had dug previously. So um, holes in the ground that we had dug, then watched our dogs go in and rummage through for garbage and stuff. And because that's what we think is important is not that when you go to an archaeological site, you're going to look at a bunch of holes that dogs dug. But what you're going to see is a bunch of holes that people dug and then filled in with their garbage and then dogs go through and rummage and leave a very um, uh, uh, leave their signature in how they dig through it. And uh, we think that people, you know, archaeologists have underestimated mm-hmm. um, how much disturbance they have in their features. They because they see these these um, what they think are reused pits, which we're quite convinced aren't reused, but were in fact dug through by dogs. They're cool if very weird creatures. <laughs> I'm always but fascinated by, by how excited they are to see you when you come when you come home or you know, they're just like, Hello. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the good thing it's about good greyhounds. What I like what I like about greyhounds is when you come in, they come up to you and they say hello. And then once you say hello, then they're like, Okay, fine, you know, <laughs> feed me, you feed them, and then they're <laughs> They hang out on their own beds. They're they're complete couch potatoes, uh, and uh, they're you walk them once a day. Otherwise, they're they're a lot like cats, uh, except they don't do the annoying thing where they crawl on your lap or whatever. <laughs> like yeah, I don't the, see anyone uh, any of them jumping on your lap as we uh, as we speak. <clears throat> it's very not, common in Zoom calls these days. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, the, the greyhounds are uh, for the most part are laid back, very laid back dogs, and so they're they're easy to deal with. Um, they're they're very affectionate, but once they once they had their their fill of being affectionate, then they'll go and they'll leave you alone until it's time for them to go and do something else. Yeah. So. All right. Um. Well, last question here. Um. So what does the future hold uh, post-retirement? What kinds of things will you be working on? Uh, an archaeologist never really retires, do they? Um, I don't know. Um, as far as whether they actually retire or not, I think we tend to die before we finish our work. Um, <laughs> is, is the problem. And I, and I have that same problem, which is <laughs> that I have literally tons of material from Crescent Bay and Schmeling and Kashan Creek Village that still have not been completely analyzed. Um, I started with a campaign uh, out there that I would only work one every other year. So take a field season, then take a summer season to do the analysis. Do you know? So instead of collecting all this material like so many archaeologists did, well, unfortunately for me, or fortunately for me, it depends on how you want to look at it. The sites we excavated were so full of material and so rich that there was absolutely no way, even with a really great crew, dedicated uh, graduate students that I had, uh, including yourself, um, there is no way to keep up with it. And I have a backlog of material that will keep me going forever and uh, will, you know, be around for future archaeologists to look at and my my goal is to leave everything in a shape that future people can come and and use it as a resource anything that's not archaeology related that you want to do once you retire once you have all this free time um hang out with my wife um <laughs> uh, celie's been a wonderfully supportive uh, companion for 30 years now and more than 30 years now and um, I owe her, uh, a lot of travel actually. Um, <laughs> um <laughs> that sounds we, nice. We off, yeah. Well, you know, my summers were filled with going out to Crescent Bay and, and, uh, so I owe her a lot. And, um, uh, so we'll probably be doing some traveling when, when that becomes feasible again. Um, and, uh, just, you know, my, I love to garden. And so I intend to continue to do that. And there's, of course, there's plenty of the usual projects around the house that need to be done. Um, mm-hmm. But I think mostly, uh, you know, when we have the chance, um, 
see our um, our daughter and her husband and our, our grandchildren out in uh, central Pennsylvania, you know, just and then friends all over the country and love to go back and visit various parts of, of uh, Europe. You know, I particularly like to go to Ireland, but we'll we'll spread out and go to other places as well. Uh huh. Oh, poor shame, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, hopefully. You know, I mean, just obviously depends on on how the how the pandemic works out and how uh, you know everybody's the vaccinations of the world work out. You know, see yeah. how, that, how that happens. Yeah. But it would be nice to do a, a little. But but I am going to be anchored to the work. I mean, the work <laughs> isn't over. You know, uh, like I said, I just have still got lots of questions to answer. I'm sure. Lots of questions to answer, and a lot of things I thought I answered that are probably wrong, and I need to go back <laughs> and, and fix them. You, I think you know how that's that a casualty of a long career, though. Well, uh, Jim Brown told me at one point uh, in his career, he said, "Look, I spent the first 20 years of my career saying things about uh, the." Mississippian world, and I spent the second half of my career correcting all of my mistakes from the first half. <laughs> and that's, I found myself following in exactly that same pattern, you know. So uh, I've got another, hopefully, 20 years to uh, um, fix what I've messed up. <laughs> hopefully, some of it will stay, you know. It's always nice to have some things that, that don't change that much, but. But clearly, as we get more data and we get more sites excavated, we'll um, we'll have a different worldview, th different theoretical views, and mm -hmm. I hope to be able to you know to move along with it. Well, so. I think that's what keeps archaeology exciting too, is that we're constantly learning new things and discovering new things and re uh, reimagining what worlds could have been like, and I think that's what keeps the the field vibrant. Um, absolutely, and the one thing that I have that um, that has worked to my advantage is the fact that I did spend uh, 10 years in Northern Illinois, and then I spent nine years working in Northern Indiana, very different uh, types of archeology span there. And now that I spent 20 years here in Wisconsin, it's given me uh, very different views of what went on between the lower Illinois River Valley, the upper Illinois River Valley, the upper rock up here, the, you know, uh, the Three Rivers area in Northeastern Indiana, Ohio, Northwestern Ohio area. Um, and it's given me a perspective where I can ask different kinds of questions that the people who really drill down in one area have, haven't been able to ask because they don't get that outside stuff. So I, I think I've been successful in bringing those different perspectives in. And I just hope that I'm able to maintain that with, you know, <laughs> let people continue to come in from other areas and, and keep me honest, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's the key. Well, great. Uh, well, thanks again for sitting down with us, Bob. Um, I know I can speak for everyone at UWM that your contributions to the department have been critical uh, to making this department one of the best in the country. And uh, I really hope to see you in and out of the lab in the future. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice of you to say. I, I appreciate that a whole bunch. And uh, again, I just have to say it's it's been an amazing place to work. I've great colleagues, both cultural and bio colleagues have been wonderful to us archaeologists, and I hope that uh, they feel we've reciprocated. All right. Well, take care, Bob. You too, Pete. Take it easy now, okay? That is all for this episode of Ask a Professor. Uh, for more videos and information about our program, please follow us on social media or visit us at uwm.edu backslash anthropology.